David is a birch bark canoe craftsman and educator, a Passamaquoddy who hails from Zabayak. Zabayak. <laughs> Thank you. And he, his great grandfather, Sylvester Gabriel, was the very last of the birch bark craftsmen from that earlier generation. He's carried forward that tradition. And not only in producing the incredible canoes by hand, but also by teaching and carrying that forward through his education programs, both with native youth and with youth throughout the state and beyond. We're so fortunate tonight to have David with us to speak about the construction of birch bark canoes, but also what happens before you even get to construction. So mm -hmm. we're, we're grateful to have David Moses Bridges. Sure. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'll put that right there. How is everybody tonight? Good. good. My good friend Sarah Glad, who asked me if I would say a few words at a small meeting. And <laughs> Way to go, Sarah. <laughs> she said there would be lobster, free lobster. <laughs> she must know that I make it a practice not to practice what I say. But I think she also knew that when I'm speaking about the Wabanaki people, and about the past, the present, and the future of the Wabanaki people, that it comes from the heart, and there's no way you can practice what comes from the heart. So, tonight I just wanted to talk a little bit about, um, I guess uh, Sarah asked me to talk about the arc of my life as a Wabanaki man in Maine over the last 50 years, uh, and about what that's meant, what I've noticed, the things I remember, and the people I've worked with. Um, it's been a long and beautiful journey and I hope for many more years of working with my elders because that's what it's come down to. Um, in my life I was very very fortunate to to have incredible artists, craftsmen, storytellers, um, musicians, people around me when I was growing up. It was, uh, it was a very special time. I, I grew up on the Sipayag Reserve and I, um, I learned how to love that land. I learned how to, to recognize the smells and just the sights, to hear the stories of the elders and the things that are so important to growing up um, and noticing the world. And I noticed the world and I noticed what the people were doing and what the people were saying and I heard the old stories. It was a very special time for me. It was, uh, it was the 60s. And the official policy of the United States government at that time was called termination. The Termination Act of 1953 was the official policy towards indigenous peoples in the United States. And termination is just what it sounds like. Termination. You're gone. It was a tough time to be indigenous. And it was a tough time to hang on to what you had. And the official policy in the state of Maine was one of denial that we even existed. Native people were not given the right to vote in federal elections in Maine until 1957. The state of Maine did not votify the Indian Voting Rights Act of 24 until 57. And until 1967 didn't have the right to vote in state elections. We were unrecognized. And if you looked in Webster's Dictionary for the year 1962, the year that I was born, and you looked under Passamaquoddy, a tribe of Indians that formerly inhabited the coast of Maine. So we were gone. We were gone. And if we weren't gone in body, then we should hurry up because that was the way it was looking and it was a tough time. I grew up proud of who I was. I grew up with a family that was proud of who they were, proud of what they did and proud of who their families were and what their families had accomplished. And for that, I, I carry that forward as often as I can to people around the state of Maine. I was lucky to have my grandfather, Sylvester Gabriel, as part of my life. He was the last of the old time canoe makers. He was the last in a, in a long line of canoe makers that goes back 3,500 years in the state of Maine. That's how old the tradition of birch bark canoe building is in this area. He was a native speaker. He knew the old stories. He had worked as a hunting and fishing guide, bark basket maker, bark canoe maker. He knew the old ways and he raised me when I was younger. You know, we're in a market economy now. My mom and dad had to work. And back then, daycare was grandma and grandpa. So, <laughs> I was lucky for that. I wish it was still that way. Because um, we walked outside. He pointed to things and we noticed things. And he told the old stories. 
And I don't know if any of you read that plaque in there that's on the wall. I hadn't seen it in a couple of years, but one way he used to keep me interested was by talking about Captain Crunch and Galooscub as if they were best friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if he saw my interest wavering, he'd throw Captain Crunch in there. And then I got, then it perked up my interest again. <laughs> <So> <laughs> But it was a very special time. My grandmother Beatrice Soctoma was a brown ash and sweet grass weaver. So we used to gather grass for her, weave grass with her, watch her work, stay with her when she's working and try to pick up the scraps that she would throw on the floor and try to make things. And this is how it was. It was very, very, very special. And one thing I couldn't help but notice later in life was that not so many people have had that experience where they have a house full of elders and a whole world before them where they can get outside. I noticed this when I started working as a camp counselor when I was a young man, 18, 19, and 20, that some of these kids had never even been outside in the, in the water before. They'd never tried to navigate a boat. They had never walked in the forest. They didn't know one tree from the other, a cedar from a pine. And for me, that just seemed like such a loss, such a loss. And to have had the knowledge that I had passed to me, passed in such a natural way, so that it becomes a part of your heart and a part of your soul. To see that that wasn't being passed to future generations just seemed like a travesty to me. And for me, it, uh, I could only help but include them. I couldn't exclude anybody from that. And I wanted to share the things that I had heard, all the old stories. Um, and that's what I began doing. I started working as an educator as a very young man and I started working more deeply with my elders learning from them while they were still with us. Many, many of them have passed on now but through my time with them I've collected older stories and older ways of thinking about things and I've been able to pass that on to the next generation because in the end we're only mediums for the next generation as we're here now. We take from the elders and we give to the youngers and then the youngers eventually will be elders and then they give to the youngers and it just continues. You know, Wabanaki people survived on this land for 12,000 years and they did it by knowing this land, by being intimately aware of everything it had to offer and every change that might come, seasonally, weather, whatever, they, they were ready. They knew how to deal with things. They knew which materials out here were useful to them. They learned it by trial and error by practice and grandfathers would show it to their grandsons and the tradition continued. People survived. It's not an easy place to survive. One thing I always try to share with my students when I work with them here and elsewhere in the state of Maine, whether they're indigenous or non-native, is that it's not as easy as it is now. We get so insulated now when we travel from a heated home to a heated car to a heated school and back to a heated car and then when we're hungry we run to the store we get food there's so much more involved to understanding this land and that food acquisition aspect of it is something I work with with Sarah in our programs here is sharing with people is that this land has everything we need right here it's provided for generations of Wabanaki people and if we take care of what we have it's going to be here for the next generation. But we have to remember that this is the land that provides. You know, we're a beautiful garden that's floating around in space. And you don't have to look any further for the Garden of Eden because we're in it. This is it. It's a beautiful, beautiful, self-sustaining planet if we care for it. And I think that message is, is lost sometimes in the, you know, in the, the world of media and devices and, you know, distractions that we have now. The DRA and several other programs in the state have been on the vanguard of introducing our children back to that natural world, to preserving the, the interest, you know, and the...